Hello everyone and welcome to my talk at the State of the Map. I'm going to be concerned with questions like which restaurants in Heidelberg are wheelchair accessible or what's the distance from Empire State Building in New York to the closest shoemaker. In principle, they are answerable using knowledge from OpenStreetMap. And how this is going to be done is the topic of my talk. I'm going to present NL Maps, a natural language interface for OpenStreetMap. I worked on it during my master's thesis at Heidelberg University uh, at the Department of Computational Linguistics. And I'm happy that I can share some of the work here with you. I'm not going to go into too much detail in the computational linguistics side, but I hope that um, you can understand enough of it. And if you have any questions about this, we can talk about it later in the question answering session. So first I'm going to introduce the problem and some previous work that has been done on it. Then I'm going to improve some data that has been collected in previous work. Then I'm going to show you my web interface and tell you about some experiments and about the results of an online learning simulation. So in Google, we can already ask questions like wheelchair accessible restaurants in Heidelberg or which restaurants in Heidelberg are wheelchair accessible? And we're going to get, curiously, different results for these. But the point is we get results and we want to have the same in OpenStreetMap. So I'm going to use two search tools here. The one is Nominatim, which is a geocoder, of course. And Nominatim can select places and areas by their names. And you can also rank those places by importance. So Paris is probably the Paris in France and not some obscure town in the Midwest of the US. Um, it can also answer some simple tag queries like restaurants in an area, um, but it cannot answer complex tag queries, which uh, includes unions and intersections like the one with wheelchair accessible restaurants. Then we have the overpass API. It is very complex and we can answer all kinds of uh, complex queries with it, but it is limited with respect to searching for names because the place name selection only works with exact match or regular expression match and we cannot normalize the place names. And they can also not rank places by their importance. This is an example where we select the overpass area named Heidelberg, and then we select all nodes, ways and relations, which have the tags amenity restaurant and wheelchair equals yes in this area. And as we see, we already get a nice result. So what we want to have this, not in this fairly complex query language, but in a natural language query. And this was already an idea by Caroline Lawrence, then called Haas, and Stefan Rietzler. They published NL Maps, a data set uh, containing English and German natural language queries, and the translation into custom machine readable language, which is, which is called MRL. The proposed goal of this data set is to parse a natural language query into an MRL query. They later expanded that data set with, with auto-generated templates to almost 30,000 examples. And we want to look at what these look like. Um, so again, we have a natural language query. Then we have its rendering in a machine-readable language. And we can see that most of this we can just put into the OPAS query language. Um, but there's one thing we want to find the name of the selected places, and this is not in the overpass query language. This has to be done afterwards. But in principle, it's very similar to the overpass query language. So the idea is to use neural machine translation to translate from the natural language query as a source language to the machine readable language as a target language. This has already been done by Lawrence and Rietzler in 2018. They used a token-based model and had a separate NER model and uh, reached 90% accuracy. 
uh, Michael Staniak later improved this result to 94% accuracy with a character-based model. I'm going to explain what this is in a second. So these are very high accuracy numbers, right? So 94% of queries have been parsed into the exactly right machine readable language query. So is it solved? No, because unfortunately, the accuracy drops very sharply on new queries. And this is explained by several issues in Analysis 2. But let's first talk about what this NMT really is. So I can't really explain all of it in this talk, but the gist of it is that we have a bunch of weight matrices and we transform the source language sentence into the target language sentence. For example, to translate the English language sentence maps do not bite into the German language sentence Karten beißen nicht. Um, we first encode the uh, source language sentence into hidden representations. Each of these is a vector in the end. And then the decoder first receives a start token and then decodes uh, or predicts the first uh, token, it may be Karten. It is fed then again to the second step and it predicts bison and so on until we predict that an end token is produced, uh, in which case the decoding ends and we have produced a sentence. So like I said, all of this is powered by lots of lots of weight matrices and they are optimized by creating descent on training data set. You can read lots of this on the web, but I cannot explain more about this in this talk. So my mission in my master's thesis was to fix the issues in NLM versus 2, which I'm going to explain in a second, then to train a decent model as a starting point, build a web-based system for online learning, and to collect also a new data set of natural language ML pairs from actual humans, because the one we will see in a second is actually generated by templates. The previous dataset LNFs versus 2 has several problems, including very, very little linguistic variety on the NATO language side, and also little variety with respect to location names. Let's look at this uh, sample. Here we can see that there's a very limited number of patterns. We have how many three times and is there four times and even in the is there close by pattern they look very much alike so we don't have lots of different queries or wordings of queries which makes it difficult for the model to generalize to new wordings of a query and we have only 80 areas in total in almost 30,000 queries of which three areas, Paris, Heidelberg and Edinburgh, occur 3,000 times and the others occur not so often. This is of course not a good distribution. And also the area names that have been used are very simple, for example Paris, instead of more complex ones or ones involving diacritical marks and so on. To solve these problems, I generated a new dataset with more patterns, more variations within a pattern, a smoother place name distribution, larger diversity in place names, so from different locations of Earth, and also better distribution in the use of OSM tags. I did this with the Python library Jinja using probabilistic templates, which I'm going to show in a second, and I added noise to simulate typing errors. Let's look at an example of a very simple template for generating a query about opening hours. Uh, for example, it can go, when can I visit the cinema in London? And it chooses which phrases to use according to a probability distribution, which is given here. The numbers are just made up, but I think they make sense because this is what I come up with. 
These are 10 random samples from my new data set. And we can see that there is a larger variety here. And also the place names are very real life. For example, here we have di diacritical marks and even very strange place names like robot in all caps. And the entropy rate, uh, which I estimated in diagrams, is raised from 2.11 to 2.93, which suggests that actually the linguistic variety went up. Now for a quick demo in the web interface. I'm going to use the slides for this, but we can also try it live later on. For example, we can ask a question like, which are the opening times of places in Heidelberg to buy auto equipment? And we're going to receive uh, an MRL parse for this. Here is the raw MRL parse, and here's a more human readable version of it. And then this is the answer that is selected from OpenStreetMap using an equestria a query to overpass. And we also receive a map with the highlighted places and we can click on them and them and receive some information about them. What happens if the pass is incorrect? Show me the wind converters in Turing. So it doesn't know the term wind converter which is a wind power plant. And it selects a made up tag graft equals wind, which doesn't exist. And it retrieves zero results. So we can correct the parse. And we are actually receiving some help for this because we can look up the word wind in the app tag finder, uh, which suggests these tags here and then we can use the generator source equals wind tag to insert it in this form and we can then uh, send the feedback to NLMAPS and it's going to learn from the feedback and then next uh, try when it is asked about wind converters hopefully it will get it right. How does it work? So this is the web interface. This is the user. The user asks a natural language query. The web interface then forwards the query to a machine translation server, which lives on a different machine, actually. It translates the natural language query into the MRL query, sends it back to the web interface. The web interface then retrieves the correct result from OpenStreetMap using overpass and nominatim and then gives the GeoJSON as a map and also the MRL query back to the user. So how does the feedback giving work? Using the natural language query, uh, we can look up the keywords in the query and give them to Tag Finder. Tag Finder is going to suggest some tags that match these keywords of the query. The user can then be informed by these tags and also maybe consult the wiki and then correct the parse that was, that was given to them. And then the user can send the feedback, which consists of natural language query they uh, issued earlier and also the corrected MRL query. This is then going to be sent to the machine translation server where the model is updated so that hopefully it will get it right next time. Accepting the keywords for Tag Finder uh, is done using TFIDF. I'm not going to go into detail here now. Let's look at the experiments. I also did an annotation experiment. I hired several annotators via the OSM talk mailing list in the OSM subreddit. And they used the web interface I built for issuing 4,152 queries, of which I eliminate, eliminated some. And some were also without an MRL. Um, 
which left 3,773 queries in the end. And I manually corrected some ML NL pairs uh, because of consistency issues. So these were the annotators. The nice thing is that they were from all over the world and also had mixed knowledge of OpenStreetMap. The not so nice thing was that all of them were male. Of course, this is due to the OpenStreetMap demographics, at least in part. But in the future, I suggest to explicitly target female mappers for experiments like this, for example, by writing to GeoGcars or other female-centered OSM groups. Okay, now for the results. I trained the same model that also Staniak trained because he had lots of success with the model itself. Uh, then I have some different versions of NLMaps here. Version 2.1 is a fixed version of NLMaps versus 2. Version 2 has some tag issues which with, with wrongly used tags, which I fixed in 2.1. Otherwise, it is exactly the same. Version 3 is 2.1 plus my new synthetic queries, which have a larger linguistic variety. And version 4 is the newly collected dataset, which is actually consisting of human queries. These queries are those that the annotators um, issued. So we can see that the model trained on version 2.1 performs very bad in the human queries. The model with the added new queries, which I generated, performs significantly better than the one trained on, on 2.1. And of course, if we then fine tune this model by again training it on 3 and 4, it achieves the best result with almost 60% on the human data set. And this is what I consider the state of the art now. So this means 60% of human issued queries can be answered correctly at this point. What is online learning? Online learning means learning from user feedback immediately after it has been given. This is opposed to storing it in some database for learning later on. And we also want to update quickly for user motivation, so the user shouldn't have to wait one hour after issuing their feedback for the model to learn. It should be happen in seconds or maybe minutes. And we also don't want to deteriorate performance on the existing examples, of course. I made a lot of experiments with this because this is also one of the foci of my work. I'm going to only show this one graph here. So this dotted line here is the performance of the model pre-trained on version 3. So the synthetic queries but not the human generated ones. And then we give feedback after feedback from the, using, from the human annotated examples. And this way we simulate the online learning setting. So this is basically one pass over the human annotated data set. And after this one pass, the best model I have has an accuracy of 53% here which is all right, but of course we saw earlier that there is the almost 60% which has been learned in offline batch learning. So the online learning simulation shows that it can be done in online learning way, but it's not as good as the batch learning way. So in retrospect, I have fixed lots of issues in, in LMS versus 2. I generated a new data set, NLMS versus 3, with a larger linguistic variety. I collected a new data set, NLMS versus 4, of actual user queries. And I built a web interface for using and improving NLMaps. 
And in the future, I hope to extend the MRL, for example, by allowing to refer to a user standpoint, to ask something like restaurants near me. Then I want to train also a model based on subword units as opposed to characters. And I maybe use also the pointer mechanism that has been used in CLE for copying place names. I think it will also be helpful to make use of word representations that have been pre-trained and not just use the linguistic uh, data stored in the dataset itself, because this way we can make use of pre-trained larger corpora. Then of course now the model only works in English and it would be helpful for other languages of course as well. Yeah. Let's discuss what you think about it. Again, I hope you can hear me this time. And apologies, but uh, uh, there was a technical uh, issue with the uh, uh, with the audio uh, when I was introducing uh, the talk uh, some 20, 25 minutes uh, ago. So I'll try to repeat a bit just before. Um, coming to the Q&A uh, session after this very interesting talk. Um, let me just uh, reintroduce the academic uh, track um, that basically uh, started with this talk. And uh, we ran through the whole, uh, uh, let's say, day uh, with nine uh, talks, uh, five before our break and in the main uh, uh, track, and then four just after the break uh, in the uh, um, in the track uh, of workshops and uh, panels. So my name is Marco Minghini. I'm um, co-chairing this uh, uh, track. Just as a, a reminder, this is the fourth edition of the academic uh, track within the State of the Map uh, conference. The idea of the academic track is uh, to showcase the research, the scientific applications of OpenStreetMap. So basically to give a space also to researchers uh, to actually present what they are doing to the whole OSM community. But this doesn't mean that these talks are only for researchers. On the contrary, the idea is exactly to connect um, researchers and uh, uh, academics uh, uh, with the whole uh, OpenStreetMap community, because in a way, uh, one cannot work without the others. And often there are needs and requests from the OSM communities that actually research and science can and should uh, address. So it's very important that they do not really um, uh, take parallel ways, but uh, try to meet with each other. So that's exactly the idea of the academic track. And we are happy uh, that we selected uh, quite some uh, interesting uh, um, uh, abstracts uh, and, and presentations also for uh, this uh, year. So the idea would be now to move to the Q&A uh, session. I'm not sure if Simon uh, is uh, here um, in the room because I cannot currently see uh, him. Looks like Simon is not available. He was available before, so maybe let us just wait a few more seconds. Simon, can you hear me? Simon, can you hear me? Like Simon is not available. I'm, I'm there. Hi, Simon. Okay, great. So thanks a lot for your talk. Um, if you can hear me, we are ready to go uh, to hear. the Q&A session. Simon, can you hear me? And, yes, uh, I can. We're there were a number of questions uh, asked uh, in the in the question tab, and I invite yes. the attendees to actually ask additional uh, questions uh, while we uh, start with the first one. So, uh, Simon, first question um, uh, is this one: uh, Did you consider named entity recognition? There were a number of questions uh, asked uh, in the in the question tab. I invite yes. the attendees to actually ask additional uh, questions uh, while we uh, start with the first one. So, uh, Simon, first question uh, uh, is this one: uh, Did you consider name and mission? Um. So, 
I think that Simon, did you hear the first question? Okay, so I will change to pick your button, I think. Um, okay, can you repeat the first question? Sorry, yes, I, I yes. So, first question, did you consider named entity recognition? Uh, yes, this was actually done earlier by Caroline Lawrence and the previous model. They had uh, two models, one for NER identity recognition and one for uh, the translation. Um, and this is, of course, a viable option, um, but in my character-based model, I don't need it because I can uh, just make the entities up by copying the characters from the source. And this is just simpler because I only have one model. Thanks a lot, Simon. And I, of course, hope these answer the, the question. There will be a way to uh, interact with the speakers, but I'll mention these at the end of this Q&A uh, session. Let me go on with the second uh, uh, question. Um, is the model uh, uh, only working in uh, the English language? And is the data set only in English right now? Yes, currently it's only in English. Um... But yeah, it's on the roadmap to make it available in other languages as well. I think the, mo the easiest way is to just translate the uh, natural language queries with a tool like DeepL or so. Um, and this should yield reasonable results, I guess. Thanks, uh, Simon. And let me just uh, go to uh, the next one. Uh, the next one is about basically how uh, you extracted the uh, geographic names from OpenStreetMap. So the question asks, did you consider all the possible names from OpenStreetMap or only a subset? So, for example, did you just uh, are you just using the um, uh, admin names uh, or the place names uh, or the names of the points of interest of the mountain peaks, for example? So what is your database actually uh, including? Yes. Um... It, it was two steps. I first uh, selected manually some areas uh, which I wanted to select names for. These were areas uh, all over Europe and other countries with Latin alphabet languages. Um, for example, I selected names around Munich, names around Riga, names around Rome, I guess. And uh, I selected all the all names I could find with a name tag. So it wasn't limited to any kind of uh, other tag, like administration <laughs> level or something like that. Just name tags, name equals anything. OK, so if, if I understood it correctly, you just looked at the name tag, of course, applied to everything. But you did not, for example, consider the uh, alternate name tags, which is might yes. be another source. Okay, good. But I think it, it's just a, it would be just a matter of just extending or changing uh, um, uh, easily, you know, the, the model in order to uh, take into account more uh, tags. Yeah, of course. Um, we we can we have lots of names available uh, on Earth. Uh, that wouldn't be a problem, of course. The the thing is, it should be able to copy every name there is. So it, it's not important to have. Uh, every name that is not OpenStreetMap, of course, it's just important to um, have a representative sample of names. Yes, sure, I agree. And uh, uh, th thanks a lot, Simon. Uh, let me just check if there are other questions. In the meantime, I do not see any uh, additional questions, but I still invite the uh, attendees to ask and use the, um, use the, uh, the questions uh, tab to do that. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we, as the scientific committee, prepared uh, some additional questions. So let me just go through them quickly. Um, uh, an interesting one is the so can uh, the model basically be used the other way around? So you use natural language comments to suggest tags. Uh, can you specify that again? What do you want to yeah. do? If you can basically use also natural language uh, to suggest the tags. Uh, so, for example, you, you are tagging something, you are mapping something, and then you 
then you say, I want to map this uh, basket for dog excrement bags, and then it's supposed to, to take yeah, the bags? Yeah, I think the, the, the idea here is that basically when you when, when the model basically do not, let's say, understand a, 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 the, the, the right tag, if you can use natural language also to suggest that specific tag uh, to be used okay. to, as an input. Uh, no, currently not. So currently it's only the NL query that is in any way processed by natural language understanding, not uh, suggestions. Yeah, sure. Not that that would be clearly. It was just uh, an idea maybe for some uh, future uh, work. Um, and yeah, thanks, for, yeah, thanks for addressing uh, these. Uh, another question. So what if uh, basically the, there are in OpenStreetMap two or more locations that have exactly the same names in the same country? Um, yeah, of course, it's possible that, um, that that's, of course, a very possible um, thing. And currently, it uses the name that is ranked highest in Nominatim. So, for example, if you ask for restaurants in Paris, it will look for Paris, the, the capital of France, and not for some Paris in the US. Uh, and I think it would be good to, in this case, to tell the user that there have been other uh, places found with that name, that they could manually say, no, I wanted to have this name. Uh, but that's, yeah, it's on the roadmap, but I don't think I will get to this uh, very soon. Yeah, clearly. You know, the, so this is a work in progress, of course, and uh, I think what you have shown is already very, very uh, promising. And uh, um, I think we are all uh, looking forward to actually uh, seeing uh, the next developments of this uh, work. So I, I think I, I hope. Uh, well, I'm, I'm sure it's it's great for you also to get uh, ideas uh, on on how to go on with that work. I want to ask uh, another question, basically coming back to the uh, starting of this work. So. Um, um, when you started to develop these, I mean, did you have any specific use case in mind or uh, were you working or influenced by any specific community or do you have a, you know, a target actor in mind? So who can most benefit from these um, in your idea or at least in your uh, initial idea? Um, yeah, that, that's a good question. I think, uh, well, what, what I mostly hope to do is make it available as an API that can be consumed by map apps, for example, OSM and that would be nice, of course. Um, I mostly went off what I what I myself sometimes need. Uh, for example, I want to go eat somewhere near a place where I am or something like that. Um, yeah, pretty general audience, I guess. OK, perfect. Uh, um, so. If there are no other questions, and I don't see any um, in the chat, I think we can uh, quickly wrap up. Um, and uh, once again, thanks, uh, Simon, for this uh, uh, very interesting uh, uh, presentation on applications of natural languages, actually, for OpenStreetMap. Um, it's basically almost the first time, and in, actually, Simon showed us that there is not such a huge amount of literature on that. Uh, topic. So I think it's very fascinating and uh, um, uh, interesting for everyone. This is why I invite anyone who would be interested to have a chat or a lively discussion with uh, uh, Simon to join uh, the uh, post talk chat room on the Venueless platform where Simon will uh, be, uh, will stay for the next, uh, uh, let's say, uh, 10, 20, uh, half an hour, 20 minutes, half an hour, whatever the need uh, is. So Simon will be there. I really invite all of you to uh, join him uh, in that session and uh, um, ask him any any question or if you have really any any doubt. The idea of this room is really to meet the speakers and, uh, in the very same way that we were used to do uh, physically. Uh, uh, so uh, with that, uh, I would uh, thank again Simon for the great uh, presentation. Um, and, uh, I, I want just to add um, one thing for the academic track as uh, every year we are also producing the proceedings. The proceedings are a collection of the short papers written by the author. So for each talk that you will hear today, there will be a short paper published 
Uh, unfortunately, proceedings are not yet ready. We are working hard to finalize them and they will be ready next week. So next week from the uh, conference website uh, and uh, probably after or below each uh, below each talk, uh, you will get a link to the paper uh, published in the proceedings. So Simon also wrote the paper. So you will have the chance to really read a uh, short paper of some pages to understand more uh, detail. And, and of course, if you are an academic, uh, you will find it very um, interesting also uh, for your future um, research. So thanks a lot. And the next talk again in the main track will be another very interesting talk. The title uh, will be um, let me find it. The title will be What Has Machine Learning Ever Done for Us? So, if you are interested in applications uh, of machine learning uh, in OpenStreetMap, then do not miss it. Thanks again, and uh, see you in the next uh, talk.